Good afternoon, mm -hmm. everyone. I'm an MFA intern. My name is Paige Disler, and I'm here with our juror, Tom Walton, for our Elemental show for 2022. Hi, nice to meet you. So the theme of elements has a mythical potency to it. It's our way of understanding the characteristics of nature and how we as humans relate to them. For example, when considering the qualities of fire, on the one hand, we work with fire to make food and heat our homes. On the other hand, we learn to contain and respect this destructive power. From an energetic perspective, we also recognize that elements exist in our being as a metaphor for feeling. The arts have a history of harnessing our relationship to the elements to create a powerful expression of how we feel in relationship to nature. I think of Vivaldi's Four Seasons, using the elemental qualities of the seasons to infuse a piece of music with a structure that met Vivaldi's relationship to each season. Part of the power of relating to elements is how it is used as a universal symbol, as a way to prep our audience for a personal expression. We have a collective sense for what water symbolizes, yet when we see how one person relates to it through their use of form, we can sense their individual perspective. At a time when nature is asking us to consider our relationship to it, the work that stood out for me in this ex exhibition were the pieces which consciously placed humanity in context with the element. Starting off with our honorable mentions, our first piece is Contemplating the Future by Judy Gunther. Yeah, so this was, this sort of relates to what I was talking about. I felt as I was looking through the work and and I, and I do want to state from the beginning that one of the great things about art is that it's inherently subjective. So what I mean by that is I am bringing my own sense of taste when I'm choosing work. I was thinking about the theme, but art is inherently subjective, meaning there isn't an objective truth to what makes a good piece of art or a bad piece of art. And I guess I'm stating that because I myself have applied to a number of things. Um, and being a teacher, I encourage my students to apply to things. And, you know, one of the things you discover when you apply to things is that it often surprising what you get into and what you don't get into. So, you know, I'm looking through this work. I, I was trying to pay attention to my own subjectivity within that. And if you, if a person applied to this show and didn't get in or didn't get honorable mention or didn't get a prize, I wouldn't view it as an indication of the quality of the work, but more... It could be a curiosity about my particular subjectivity. And when I say my subjectivity, what I mean is both my relationship to art. So like when I apply to shows or I tell students to apply to shows, I often tell them to look at the juror's work. Uh, so that's part of it. My own sense of what I have, the kind of taste for art I've developed over time. And that can kind of help you understand why a juror chooses something. The other thing, I think worth thinking about in terms of subjectivity is the moment. So what's what's going on in the world right now? What could be influencing that juror in terms of what they're looking at? Um, and there is a sort of collective consciousness about what we respond to. Uh, so I'm bringing that up right now because, you know, this is kind of, it's sort of the second part of the jury show. The first part is, gosh, a lot of people apply. And so to statistically, it's very unlikely to get into something. Um, and you can ask yourself, why apply then? And, and the reason is, in my opinion, which is uh, something Walt Whitman said, that art is the gift that doesn't demand to be taken. And I really like that statement um, in this context, because that's what you're doing when you're applying to a jury show. You're, you're asking people, do you want to receive my work? But you're not demanding that they take it. And as tough as it can be when your work doesn't get into something, you just apply to the next one. And then maybe you have a curiosity about why they took it. The second thing, which I've also often been a part of, is you get into the show and feel really good. You feel like somebody received your work. Someone took the gift, metaphorically. Uh, so that's kind of, kind of sati satiating. And then uh, there's this second thing, which is like prizes. So then all of a sudden, once again, you go through the process of getting something or not getting something. So was the gift taken further? And then you feel, you could feel sort of like, well, why wasn't the gift taken? And again, I would kind of recommend this concept of subjectivity and the artist and what's going on in the moment. And there's a degree of kind of almost randomness about it, you know? 
not randomness in the sense where it's like totally random, but random in the sense where it's like, what's that artist's taste? What's their taste in that moment? And, you know, something can be timely or something can be timeless. So they can be both. I just wanted to talk about that because I felt that as we're going into talking about these artists I've chosen above others, that it's by no mean an indication of what I, who I thought were the best artists of our time, I should say. <laughs> it's more a kind of indication of what I responded to in that moment. And I think that's, that's valuable. I also will say this, someone told me this one time and it was kind of helpful, which is sometimes not getting the prize, sometimes not getting into the show even can be a sort of gift because then your art is like for you and you're ready to, you gain a kind of both a thick skin and maybe the, you've practiced that thing of trying to give without demanding the audience take it. And I would just encourage anybody who applied or, and or people who did not get prizes to, you know, keep a curiosity about it and keep applying to things because you don't know. I've been surprised. I often find that the people, the things I've gotten into are not the things I thought I was going to get into. <laughs> uh, and sometimes I'm like, why didn't I get into that? I should have, I mean, that one was obvious. So you never know. I mean, it's, it's, it's very curious. Okay, so talking about this piece right here, in my jurors statement, uh, I talked about one of the things that struck me a lot when I was looking at the work. I mean, I was obviously thinking about these elements, and I mentioned how I kind of view it as an archetype or a way to kind of a symbol that's much more universal than, let's say, like a very specific symbol. You know, it's like a very universal symbol. But by specific, I would mean like... Uh, a cup of coffee with like a something very personal for that person that we start associating it with that kind of more personal symbol these are big universal symbols that we can all relate to and, and in some sense are not even um connected to cult a, a big part of culture meaning like all cultures have some relationship to the elements so it really kind of will draw us all in with a sense of uh, a sort of prepper, you know, we're like, okay, we're talking about water. Uh, most humans have a sense of water, you know, or fire. So that, that was when I was going into, but what I'll say is subjective for me, you know, I thought about like the four seasons, I thought about uh, by Vivaldi, and I thought about how artists have often drawn on these elemental things. I thought a bit about practices I've engaged in in my time through meditation, or I have a practice in Tai Chi, where you start thinking about how do you harness these energies internally and how we relate to them. But of course, when I think about the time, it's hard not to think about how nature is sort of, you know, yapping at us right now, not even really yapping. It's sort of giving us a strong warning, starting right now with this kind of COVID thing, hence why we're online. And then asking us as humans to sort of reconcile our differences is what I feel. I feel that we have something that's likely going to happen uh, if we don't reconcile our differences. We know the science, but we haven't reconciled our differences. So, I, you know, I saw the pieces that I responded to were probably about showing the kind of power of nature, power of elements. And in this piece, you have this water right here. So you have this huge water and these wind turbines, which are for clean energy is my association with it. And then you have this small isolated figure. So you have this figure in relationship to nature. And those are the pieces I seem to respond to the most, where I could see the, the human often. In, in most cases, I think the human was small in relationship to nature. But how are we relating to nature? And what, what are we doing in relationship to nature? And it's contemplative and there's something kind of open about it, but it's also vast. What do we do about clean energy is in this and the, the nudity of the figure sort of coming back to nature. It was responsive instinctively, but most of the pieces I saw that really stuck out to me, I guess this one by Judy Gunther, Contemplating the Future. I'm really reading the title now. Those are the ones that kind of struck me. I think that, you know, the, the, that subjectivity thing is really valuable to understand in the arts. I mean, art, all of the arts are subjective, but I think they've become increasingly subjective and sort of, and at this moment, there isn't even a kind of standardized canon of what's good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, though, I, I mean, one thing seems to be true is that if you work with intention and put effort in, it has, it has value.
And, and then you, and then I think a lot of it is just being open, being open to both getting into things and being open to not getting into things. I mean, I think that's really valuable to view that almost as a success of sharing. The system is a little bit capitalist and yeah. classist, you know, obviously you're trying to choose, <laughs> but I mean, but so what's the value of that? I guess the value of that is trying to refine your tastes, but not view it as a kind of prize setting. That's the prizes can be viewed in different ways. Our next honorable mention is from Jen Sterling and it is titled Riding the Wind. So this painting struck out to me as, a, I mean, some of it was, I was thinking about how this has a relationship to the elements and how it's kind of mimicking the energy of the elements. But also it was just a painting that I responded to. I appreciated the figure ground relationship. I appreciated the way there's a kind of ebb and pull of what the focus is. You know, at first I, I really responded to that kind of flat, opaque, blue color up front. But then, you know, you look at it and you realize there are other things that become sort of the metaphorical figure, like top left corner, that stroke of green in the back. So as a painting, it, it, it's, this is where like my sense of, my particular sense of taste came in. I responded to it as a painting because um, I felt it was a painting where I could uh, see things in it um, straight away I responded to, but also if I looked at it for a long time, it would start to take on a new life. And certainly, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm a kind of artist who looks first and reads later. So the titles, I, I'll rarely read a title. It might be because I'm dyslexic. It might just be because I'm more visual. I'm not sure. Statements and titles will help me understand the work, but I look at the work first. I'm very visual. So I'm looking at this title now, Riding the Wind. And part of me, um, you know, now I think about the wind, obviously. But when I looked at it, I actually thought more about water. And I, and I, and I appreciate that the work can maybe activate on two ways. And water and wind have a kind of, obviously, an inherent relationship and that they're both about these kind of fluid moving energies. Our next honorable mention is from David Diaz and it's titled The Green of Ireland. So this painting, it was another painting where, you know, being, especially being a painter, I have almost immediate instincts on the paintings I respond to and don't. And this painting sort of instinctively captured my attention. I, I like the texture in the paint. I like the feeling of how the, that kind of island, you know, this is another kind of figure ground thing where I'm, I'm looking at that, that island and how it, the paint quality of it manages to blend into the uh, skyline. And so then in doing that, I'm not just thinking about the symbol of the island, um, but I'm starting to think about the symbol of the paint. I mean, one of the things that I think when you think about elements uh, in particular, and you're using a, a material like paint, you can represent the element, meaning you can depict the island. You can make something that depicts air but also the paint itself is, an, is, a, is a strong representation of the element, like in that last piece. So paint mimics, of course, water or, or wind. And it is, this is oil paint, so it has a connection to oil. And, and then you kind of isolate the form. And in this painting, there's this kind of gritty uh, feeling about the paint. It's got kind of a, almost like an El Greco feeling to it. And, and I appreciated that when I looked at it, like immediately. The use of color, it's got a narrow palette. There's a kind of somberness to it, which maybe is connecting to this idea I have around the kind of intensity of thinking about nature right now, the kind of power of nature and how that sky seems to almost envelop land. And I don't see a person in this one though I could easily place one into it. It's got a little bit of Turner in there too. It feels ominous and powerful. It's a nice piece by David Diaz. Yeah, I think of like actually Rembrandt had an etching where he's like facing, it's like a metaphor for making art that I, I sent to my students when COVID hit. And of course, down here in Louisiana, we have hurricanes. Uh, we're very close to the nature. But this, Rembrandt did this really nice etching. It was in the book Rembrandt's Eyes is when I saw it. Yeah. And the etching is of himself sitting with his back. He's, in, he's, in, he's next to a tree with his back to a storm coming drawing. So I, I sent it to my students. I remember when COVID hit as a reminder that, you know, I mean, it's a little bit romantic, but I think we probably need a little romance right now. I mean, literally, like we need people to feel like they can 
work together. So that has romantic elements to it. But I think a bit of like that, uh, you know, uh, like when the ship's going down in Titanic and everybody's, you know, playing music, uh, I, I feel at this moment that actually the, the arts have an important role to play because we need to figure out why we're not getting along. And the arts have always been a way to kind of engage that um, and open up kind of maybe it maybe a kind of romance. But when I say romance, I think I'm thinking more broadly, you know, like more like Greek words of love, not necessarily yeah. romantic. Like the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the, we're, we're artists. We are all the yeah whimsical people we're romantic i mean some are romantic romantic but we're all romantic you know i mean yeah. yeah we need that right now we need people to gain a sense of romance you know our next honorable mention is storm on the chesapeake by will scott yeah so this photo i mean and it's interesting like photography and painting and i've been, I've been really getting into photography more since i've actually been down here teaching for some reason i've met a lot of photographers and I've started to really digest the medium a bit more. But, you know, I, I looked at this, this photo and it, it has, again, it has this kind of powerful, romantic, ominous feeling about it. In a way, it kind of connects to that last piece with this, how the skyline has this kind of connection to this uh, water coming forward. Uh, there's a sort of mimicking of like a, the light on the bottom and the dark of the sky the value of the sky and the water are kind of similar. And then they're both uh, compositionally uh, connected to the light of the uh, water being similar in value to the top light of that cloud. Um, I mean, I think that's an interesting thing with photographers versus painters is that you're the subjectivity of the photographers, how they crop most of the time. I think about composition, obviously they can edit it, but it's, it's a, in the sense of time too, um, how they capture it. And then you got that bridge back there and that bridge of course is the human element, maybe that little pole. So again, it's, it's something about how this very powerful thing, which is an element, you know, I mean, they, uh, they're more powerful than us and yet we're connected to them because we're not separate from them. And then how have we interacted with them and how, how is that interaction now inviting us to participate in um in a new way of living so yeah it's nice storm at the chesapeake cool our last honorable mention is by susan gluver deal hmm. the political landscape amber waves of grain yeah i mean this is and i'll say that you know i mean the first thing that i look at is the visual before the and by the visual i probably mean the some the formal elements and then i start paying attention to symbolic and i say that meaning like i might also have a symbolic thing that captivates me too. When I say symbolic, I mean, what is what is, is it representing? The crow, the field, the fire. I say formal, I mean, the visual impact, that big band of yellow right there, that kind of mustard yellow against that kind of, uh, you know, the way that those stripes are kind of all interacting and the texture of the paint. It sort of just struck me as a kind of almost really powerful, clean image. and the symbolism of this uh, bird flying over this field and then the fire in the distance uh, felt again like a, a sort of warning, um, a sort of reminder that, uh, you know, the field has a connection to humanity because how, how else are we going to organize these sort of farm fields where everything's kind of organized or taken nature and reorganized it and put it into these uh, compartmental ways of um i guess using it or working with it to feed ourselves at least that was my kind of like relationship to a field like that uh, and then the fire in distance is has a you know reminder of fires that we're reading about in the country all the time and you know is that connected to to us in some way or uh, what's our relationship to that do we have a relationship to that the black crow um which i'm assuming is a crow flying over there is getting a little bit like in you know relationship to van gogh's paintings and where are we you know you think about that painting i believe it was when he did when he the, the mythology is he died shortly after that 
so, so it has this kind of ominous feeling. That being said, the, the symbology is, is interesting because the symbology is quite ominous. The actual, if I, if I didn't know that was fire, like if I didn't know that was fire right there, I didn't know the, what a black crow could symbolize as a relationship to something ominous or death. Um, visually, it's very appealing. Like if I turned it on its side or I turned it upside down, it could almost give me a feeling of uh, levity or calm. I think there's something about those two different energies happening that drew me to it. And, and I like that if we're dealing with this kind of tough concepts of nature and humans relationship to it, that, that we're giving ourselves options of how to interpret it. Uh, so there's some, there's a way in which, you know, the form is maybe indicating that uh, there's a couple things that could happen here. It could go, could be pretty intense, could be fire. <laughs> Or maybe there's a way we can, the form is sort of lighter. So maybe there's something in that shadow of the bird that's reminding us that there are other paths we can take. Looking at the color scheme, too, like the split complementary, we've got the yellow and then the oh, deep and the... orange and then the deep, deep blue. Mm -hmm. Just from like a color blocking perspective, mm. how they've, they've laid it out. She did phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, there's something very like you think about Albers or Rothko, the color yeah. is very strong. I mean, it's, and it's specific. There's that weird black line in the middle of there. Um, yeah. The texture of the kind of more orange color up front and how that relates to the orange color in the back. And I also like the way the road is kind of bending. So it's not a completely straight line, which you don't even see straight away till later. It's a very visually striking piece. The first of our jurors choice is by Lisa Cook. Yeah, so yeah, this piece is actually one of the ones that really stood out to me now some of that's going to be my taste it feels related to like a goya painting to me i yeah. like these these figures you know i'm thinking about like i'm actually thinking about the one where the uh, assassination piece he did that was i think also that mythology was also taken on by uh manet i enjoy this these groups of people kind of hustling around this fire uh, you know, it's interesting going back to titles. I mean, this is one I, I visually responded to straight away. I, I appreciated the way it was painted. I appreciated the, the figures all kind of facing the fire. And, you know, right now reading the title, I realize this book burning they're doing, which is sort of an interesting take on the elements. I also wondered too, you know, when you go to a jury show, I mean, when I apply, when I apply to jury shows, I rarely make pieces for the show. I look at my work and see if it makes sense for the show. I'm wondering now if this painting was made for the show or if they said, oh, this is a painting about book burning and there's fire involved. So I'll, I'll, it makes sense for the show. I like the idea of it being the other way around. I'm not sure. Meaning like they made a painting about book burning and about um, humans sort of having a, you know, weird political relationship to different types of books and what that says and, then later they realize, well, I've been, I painted a huge fire. I'm going to make it, it make sense for this elemental show to put it in, see what, see what happens. That has a kind of complex idea to it for me too, which is something that I'm pretty interested in with the subject matter, which is how are humans relating to each other? Meaning like we kind of know what the science is suggesting around nature right now and the solution is sort of sort of apparent to us and there's things we can do so the issue is no longer how do we get scientists more involved they're involved they've told us the issue is how are we relating to each other and why can't we get on the same page about the sort of apparent solution and that's where this idea of book burning which has much to do with how we're relating to each other in our own kind of strange social political dynamic you know this kind of weird way of relating to nature in relationship to each other. So I think it's a, I like that. I like that conceptually. I like this piece conceptually even more now thinking about that in relationship to the uh, idea of elements, um, how those elements are maybe living in us and how we can try and work together. Visually though, again, like that's what I'm responding to though. The symbolic thing is the people in relationship to the fire. The formal thing is there's something very visually powerful about this piece. Even thinking about the last piece, it's a, it reads very clean. You have these two huge shapes that kind of cut up canvas, you know, on the, on the right side, you got this big black shape that's activated by all these little red figures, you know, and it's all quite dark. 
and the figures are mimicking in a way the kind of white flame shapes on the left side. So these two shapes that are kind of almost yin-yanging against each other. So that makes for a very visually clean thing to look at. And then you start to kind of parallel those energies, the, the people uh, and their energy towards the fire, which seems to almost be, you know, pushing back at them. Yeah, strong piece. The use of texture, everything about it is is a, was appealing to me. It's very small too, five inches by seven inches, but it feels big. You know, the way, the way yes. some of those like Bruegel or Goya paintings, even though they're small, they kind of seem to contain multitudes. All right, so this piece by William G. Dusterwald, Elemental Deep Creek. So what did I respond to? I, it was just poetic to me. So I had a visual response to it, which, and then later I, I, and kind of that's how I did it. I went through and pieces stood out to me. And then I asked myself why. So for this one, uh, I do think a lot of it was the symbolism of this figure sitting in the back. It felt poetic to me. It felt a bit, it responded to my own sense of like poetry and isolation and romance, this figure working at these docks, this kind of feeling of like a dissonance as you go back, a slight, you know, poetic loneliness, this guy working out there by the water. Again, I, I mean, what I appreciated about it was this, how are humans relating to these elements and our kind of long-standing uh, relationship to them. You know, in this case, you think about, you know, fishermen is what I thought of. What's this guy doing back there? He's doing some type of kind of, it feels like labor that has been continual. So something that um, maybe this guy does daily, maybe he works there. Uh, he's just sort of taking this thing and going back and forth and has a relationship to this space that has been built upon the water by humans in relationship to it. And I think there's something about it I responded to. It's a bit, I look at the figure and the kind of body language of the figure. There's almost a kind of, um, I'm projecting here, but there's almost a kind of sadness to it as he's walking, you know, the way the, the way his head's turned down, the way he's kind of, arcing he's not sitting up directly straight it could be it could be that i'm projecting that meaning like obviously maybe that's just his uh you know body language over time not to do with this moment um it could be that to carry that thing he has to do that but for the purpose of art uh, i think it's it's interesting to think about that in this moment uh, you know, what's his, uh, what's his relationship to this daily task and how is he, how is that daily task cumulatively um, had an effect on how he has related to water? Yeah, no, I can definitely see that. And what I'm looking at is you've got the boat off to the left hand side, mm -hmm. kind of in the, the, the background. And as you go back, there's just nothingness. Mm. I'd imagine, I, I have no clue what time of year this was taken but that that little snippet in the title 2020 adds a whole different context for me of whether it's early 2020 or late 2020 where you just no, uh, have this blank background behind you of just nothingness and unknown mm, and right mm. with that background as you come in the foreground you've got this worker who we don't know what's happening but he's still going and i like visually you have these rows going from the left to the right of kind of a light vanishing point to a darker vanishing point and it's all going to him and nothingness mm. behind him mm. that's great so i yeah. can see that it's isolation a hundred percent where it is that kind of not quite sad not quite defeated but just a weird stoic it feels work you know, like when someone has done something for a long time, it feels worked, like that arc of the body. And there is a kind of sadness to it. Certainly the isolation of the figure engulfed. So this is interesting to me. I mean, I think, you know, being a painter and then looking at this photography and, you know, I get jealous of uh, photographers sometimes because they can they can enter the realm of composition and, and, you know, something that I'm drawn to is when at this moment, you know, how do we kind of engage both the conscious and the unconscious um, simultaneously? How do you get a kind of a kind of strangeness of dreams as a kind of symbol for 
working through what we're going through. How do you bring that into the forefront of our consciousness? And, you know, in painting, you get to do it because you can paint from your head and you can, uh, you can let the paint itself explore or show you how you're feeling. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's like, you gotta set all this stuff up or, you know, I don't paint from, I don't paint from photographs actually ever. Um, so you have this, I've set all this stuff up if I want to paint it. So I got to find all this stuff, but photographers can sort of quickly get to this in a way that, um, it feels like a lot of what painters have always kind of set up. Someone like Blaska is able to use mirrors and space to, a really create a complicated composition that represents the internal workings of a human. Uh, so when I look at this, uh, this photo, it says digital art. So I'm realizing that it's a photo that was manipulated. Um, it, it really kind of captivated something that I'm interested in seeing in art where I, I feel as though obviously you have this bed, um, but the bed is engulfed by this water. And then, then the water has this kind of, it's also using color to move our eye around. Uh, you have this wave that kind of comes from the right and then launches through the bed, hits the wall. That back wall is sort of confusing and the bed makes it feel like I'm obviously sleeping. So therefore I'm in a kind of dream state and that back wall feels like it's breaking uh, what could be normal. Um, I guess I imagine, is there any circumstance in which I would actually see this, um, like some sort of uh, reflection of water, maybe, maybe by the beach, but it, it seems like I'm clearly being invited into a space that uh, could not or would not likely exist in reality. So it is a sort of dream space um, and parts of it feel contextually possible, like, you know, oh yeah, there could just be light um, echoing over this this bed and and there's even a nice relationship between the water and the fabric how those two things are are mimicking each other like fabric has a kind of fluid feeling to it water has a fluid feeling to it and then and then when it hits the wall it sort of hits a kind of hard edge and we just smacks back at us and we move up to the uh mirror and then we're invited back into something that feels a bit more fluid to me and the color of it is now tapping back to the uh bed and then then that that art continues and we find our way again at this like back wall which looks the most to me unlike the mirror actually like a sudden break from the reality of the image where it, it seems to exist on a different plane almost a screen it it it's interesting when i look at it because i can see that as i spend more time with it it is one continuous wave but that back wall doesn't feel like a continuous wave the way it breaks the light. I'm guessing that's a sort of um, part of the uh, uh, manipulation on Photoshop or whatever program they're using. Um, the nice thing about something like digital art for me is that I've spent very little time on Photoshop. So I don't get stuck in the weeds of how it was made. I just sort of look at the image for what it is. Um, yeah, so I thought this piece was a, a strong piece. What I've, what I've noticed lately is when I look at work like this, I, I sort of ask myself, you know, gosh, would I want to paint that? Like, I wish I could find a place to paint that. And this sort of like, I was like, I want to find a place where I can see that in reality. Um, it, it struck me. Our next juror's choice is Patricia O'Brien, blown away. Yeah, you know, um, this piece, I think what's interesting about it, I'm look, I'm reading about it being ink on paper. It feels to me like it must almost because it's, the sky feels very photographic to me, like a kind of collage, which is, is sort of paradoxical because I feel like it, if it was ink on paper, it's an excellent rendition of the sky. Um, though I, to me, it feels like it almost must have been drawn on a photograph. Though I guess I, I'm not totally sure if I can figure that out. Can you figure that out looking at this piece? I'm realizing now. Can you tell the difference between whether that's a photograph or some master rendition of the sky? If it is a drawing, the almost overexposed quality of the background of the sky is mm -hmm. really well captured. 
really well captured, especially with the tonal shifts or the color change, uh, shifts from the really, really warm yellow out to the edges mm. to that almost green. And then that super striking light at the bottom, right at the horizon, right where those mountains are. And it gets really dark. Yeah, I mean, I feel that it, it opens up a lot of questions about how it was made. Visually, it's again, there's something very striking about it. Up front, you have these like marks that represent both the field. You know, I kind of think about like I was driving the Mississippi one time and I saw this tree that had been struck by lightning. Uh, so therefore it was kind of charred in the distance, isolated like that. And the tree sort of functions as, as a sort of formal figure in the landscape because it just sits against everything when you look at it. Uh, but then you have these marks up front, which are kind of operating on two levels. I mean, on one level, they're descriptive of the foreground, they're descriptive of a kind of uh, more even use of form because it's not so isolated as the tree. So they work as kind of real ground, but they also are active, actively working as marks, meaning like they feel like human marks that are representing the feeling of making a mark like that, which feels kind of jagged and a little bit you know, irritated in the way it's like making those marks. It brings us in and we sit on that tree and that tree breaks the skyline. And when it breaks the skyline, it seems to be almost like disintegrating into the sky. And then you have this strange sky, which is, again, it feels suddenly like we're moving away from human mark making into something that is more photographic or more I don't want to say realistic, more photographic. So it has a kind of feeling of memory of a sky to me, whereas the, the mark making up front feels very human. So I guess, you know, as I'm unpacking that now, I realize that some of what it's doing is creating this, the foreground and the ground part before we reach the horizon line and get to the sky it feels very human in its mark making. And the sky starts to feel more observed uh, more of an idea of the sky that ends up being the kind of symbolic relationship, the kind of humanity of the ground and the mark making versus the kind of description of just nature. And then the tree is acting as the kind of conduit between the two because the tree exists in both realms and then breaks apart into the sky. And there's things that connect them. The yellow in the sky is connecting to the yellow on, on the, uh, the marks in the foreground. And some of the darks on the ground are, are found again in the sky. So it makes for an interesting, visually interesting piece. Again, it feels very like ominous to me, which seems to be sort of like a concurrent theme in what I chose. And again, there's a kind of relationship between humanity and nature. And I could, of course, be projecting this. <laughs> I think that's a natural thing to do. I think it's probably on the tips of all of our tongue. And finishing us off strong, we have what water leaves behind. So, yeah, I mean, I kind of, you know, there's someone who does photography in this manner down here, actually. Um, one of my colleagues, Lily Brooks, and I'm reading about, you know, when I saw the piece, it's interesting. Um, you know, one thing that's been interesting about during a show, not in person, from pictures on a screen is that sometimes, you, you know, cause I really, I did read after, meaning like I responded to the images first um, very intentionally. And this, this particular piece, which is a photo and, I, and it's large actually, it's quite large. I uh, read it as a painting at first. It, it feels so much about texture. It feels like a, almost an abstract painting reminds me of some of the other paintings I chose. I responded to it as a, as a painting uh, in many ways, but it's a photo. And I think that's pretty interesting when things can kind of live in both worlds. And then that kind of changes the way you think about it. But I mentioned Lily Brooks because she does photography that is sort of representing how nature in relationship to humanity, because that's what we're kind of, I guess, interested in or what she was interested in, how nature has this way of leaving its own pentamente, you know, like its own kind of erasure uh, that we can then observe and see. So like a water where the water leaves behind. Living here in New Orleans, I cannot help but think about, you know, there's still, you can still see watermarks from Katrina on houses down here. And you can still see, you know, often it floods. So that flooding leaves a kind of line 
I mean, I think that's a pretty powerful and interesting and obviously harrowing kind of pentamente where you're paying attention to what's left behind by an action. But I like to think of, you know, water and nature as being not separated from humans, but connected to humans. So when I look at this piece, it, it, in the same way that when I look at a pentamente and a painting where someone has erased and drawn something, it's activating a kind of beauty for me. It feels very much when I look at this piece as though it's a landscape, honestly. Like I look at that top uh, line right there and it, it, it feels like a skyline. Those feel like trees in the distance. I think that's how I read it initially. Like, and then it could be water right there. Like literally that could be a pond. And then the foreground actually just felt like I'm back on the ground again. That's a pretty, pretty interesting thing, uh, how something can be two things at once like that. But there's, when you read about it, what water leaves behind, I mean, I think you think about it in relationship to, at least I do, maybe if those of you who aren't in Louisiana won't have this direct association, anybody down here is going to have a kind of, you know, it's interesting, like when I'm teaching, uh, I'm, I'm not from here, I'm like from uh, DC, like I was saying. And I grew up in the Northeast, but, you know, I'll be in a class teaching. And the other day I was and talking about painting and, you know, how it kind of goes. It can kind of intricately weave between painting and philosophy. And it's, you know, it starts raining behind me. And, uh, you know, I'm like focused on my class and I'm not too, not too focused on the rain behind me. But soon, and whenever it, whenever the rain picks up down here, whenever you get a little bit of a storm, uh, you know, myself being a figure painter, I'm empathetic to people. I start feeling the energy in the class and all the students, their energy rises. You, know, you can feel it. You can feel like a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of tension. I mean, whenever, you get, whenever there's a storm coming, no matter what, I think as humans, we are connected to nature. So whenever there's a storm coming, I used to get very excited when storms come because it's like powerful and I feel it in myself. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go and I don't know, run and run into that or something. But they don't have that association. <laughs> They're like it. I mean, all of the years of things they've been through. Uh, I mean, we've had recently, we've all had, you've touched on this collective trauma around COVID we have a sort of ominous trauma around nature that is coming, but they have actually experienced it. And so, uh, you know, I'm saying that meaning that when you look at that water line here, it's going to have a very different emotional response. People are going to know what it was like to have their house flooded all the way down. And they may not be able to see the way I'm trying to see this sort of poetic beauty in it. <laughs> they may not appreciate it. Like we're saying, Oh, it's like pentamente. They're going to be like, no, it's, it's like awfulness and all, on all levels. And I don't want to see the poetry in that because I lost my entire house. <laughs> I really like this, but I'm looking at this also thinking about what you were saying about your students. I'm like, how many times mm. does this picture show? How many, how many records of anxiety spiking with yeah. the rain? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about lately a lot with art, you know, is that like we have this kind of aesthetic pressure to sell art. And so, I mean, we, in other words, what do I mean by that? I mean, like, how do we quantify success of an artist? And from a capitalist perspective, and you know, you gotta think about that because we're not gonna restructure our society or we won't be able to restructure our society anytime soon. And probably we, we, we need to work with the systems that are, are present, but, the pressure on a capitalist society for any artist is how you're going to, how do you quantify success? We quantify success by either getting into a show and being recognized, um, or you quantify it by, can you sell it? And if you're going to sell a piece, um, there's something about that that means that the work has to have something aesthetically pleasing enough that your average person could live with it in their home for a very long time, right? So what that doesn't create space for is something that, like, like a Francis Bacon, for example, that kind of painting is not designed to make you just sit and feel peaceful while you're drinking your coffee in the morning, right? Like you it's designed look up at, to... at a screaming Pope and go, ah, oh, yeah, I feel, I feel calm. I feel serene. 
Yeah, and it's the it's the symbolism and the mark making. Like this, this has you know, there's nothing here symbolically. I guess once you read what it is, you realize what it's about. But if you don't, you just see the form. But but there's some, but there's also the form. Like the form of that mud is actually, you know, the more I look at it, it's it's not just about beauty. It's about redefining aesthetics. There's something gritty about it. Uh, there's something connected to the body that's like the less beautiful parts of the body, the kind of guts of the body. But that's from a, you know, from a perspective of catharsis, from a perspective of the other important aspect of art, which is not to decorate our homes, but to help us activate our minds and help us work through not just pleasing feelings, but maybe complex feelings. That's really energizing and it helps us. Um, so when I look at that, I think about that. I think about redefining success of art and how, and how in this moment, I don't know the answer to this, maybe this is something to contemplate. How do we find a way to support artists doing that? And why, why am I saying that? Because artists, I feel like having this kind of work, one, how do you support artists doing it? And two, how do you engage audiences with it? How do you invite audiences to come look at the work and engage with work that's perhaps maybe challenging symbolically and formally because I think it helps us work through complex emotions, you know? But to romanticize life. To romanticize it, yeah. To romanticize the tough parts, right? Yeah, it's easy to romanticize the good parts. I guess that looks like a Thomas Kincaid painting or something. But I'm talking about romanticizing the tough parts, like a Francis Bacon. And the tough parts, we have to romanticize because that's, what, that's the kind of, yeah, maybe the big arc of what we've been talking about. How do you romanticize the tough parts? How do you romanticize something like global warming or the tragedy we've already been experiencing through global warming or COVID? And, you know, the other side of that, I would, I would really argue is really about mental health. How do you deal with the mental health impact of all these tragedies? And how do we reconcile it in a way where we learn to work together? Because that's what we're being challenged to do. I hope there's more avenues. I'm saying I want to create a place like I have some kind of power to do this. I want to see a place. <laughs> Uh, where art that is challenging, that works through our deep emotions to romanticize it, like we're saying, to find a beauty in it, a kind of catharsis, so we can reconnect. So that's why I like this piece here by Water, <laughs> What Water Leaves Behind is by Amir Kola. I'm probably messing up the name, Mirta. Well, thank you so much for curating our show, and thank you to all of the wonderful artists who submitted their work, and thank you to everyone who has helped participate and make this show possible. And we hope to have you back sometime, or we hope to have more people submit their work to upcoming shows. Quick note, we do have our shows Strokes of Genius and Food for Thought. The last day to submit your work is September 7th. <laughs> yeah, and thank you so much again, Tom, for helping us. Absolutely, uh, it was a pleasure. It was, it was a, a wonderful it was a, show. It was a really, um, uh, compelling and interesting experience.